Hello, welcome uh, everyone to uh, this uh, side event co-organized by IUFRO and, and C4 that uh, is entitled Research for a Green, Healthy and Resilient Future with Forests and Trees. Uh, my name is, is Vincent Gitz and I'm with C4, the Director for Programs and Platforms. And to start this session, uh, I will uh, call Robert Nazi, Director General of C4 and Managing Director of C4 Aircraft to uh, say a welcome address. Robert, at, at ton tour. Merci, Vincent. Uh, good, good evening, uh, uh, everybody, and uh, both the people that are in the room and managed to find the room. That is probably, uh, if they wanted to have another room, will be outside the building. Uh, and uh, for the people online. And uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's a great pleasure for me to, to open this, uh, this new era and, and, and this uh, event, uh, because I was also the one uh, opening the CRP uh, on forestry and agroforestry in 2011. And I was the, the first uh, director of, of the CRP from uh, 2011 and 2016. And I can tell you that the beginning were quite difficult, uh, trying to have a uh, a set of uh, seven to eight organization, uh, 280 scientists working in different things, working together and, and programming together. Uh, and so that uh, I remember someone said that uh, to manage this sort of thing, you, you know, uh, you should know how to walk barefoot on broken glass. But uh, thankfully uh, it worked and, and I'm even more pleased that uh, after a while, we are, we are uh, Vincent to be the director of the second phase of the CRP, and, and then that's where Tink uh, took their flight. So it was a big success, and, and thanks also with, with all the partners and, and all the friends we have had. Uh, and <clears throat> everybody says that uh, all the good things uh, have to have an end, uh, and we did disagree, because uh, when we were informed that the FTA will close in 2021, we said, well, we don't want the partnership to close. The partnership is much more important, much bigger, much more interesting uh, than the CGIR program itself. And so we started the discussion uh, almost a year ago in terms of, okay, how can we continue uh, this partnership, expand it uh, even uh, beyond uh, what we had uh, during the, the FTA phase. And then we had discussion with all the partners, all of you that, that are in the room and, and, and online and, and to develop uh, what I expect to be uh, probably one of the largest uh, platform uh, in terms of uh, mostly tropical forest, but uh, I hope our EFI colleagues will join us and we will also have any you for to present all the forests. Um, so this is a, uh, the time to uh, announce that we have this new forest trees and agroforestry partnership. And uh, uh, of course, the, the World Forestry Congress uh, seems to be the privileged moment uh, to take stock of the last event and the new demands to our sector. And uh, that were in uh, expressed in the state of the world forest and the software that was launched here also. And uh, uh, we expect our new partnership to be uh, demand driven uh, and we crafted this uh, side event together with our colleague from IFRO uh, to question what are the important demands towards forest entries? What, what, what do you expect uh, from the whole forest entry sector uh, to contribute uh, for sustainable development, but also uh, uh, to fight against uh, climate crisis, uh, to uh, look about the biodiversity crisis and, and all the, the problem that we are facing. Uh, one of the big one being, okay, uh, are we going to move from the fossil fuel based economy to the biological bio based economy uh, if we want to effectively uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gases emission? So we need to act uh, urgently. And uh, as I said in a couple of presentations, I mean, I think the time of commitments, the time of negotiation is past. We are in 2022. Uh, May 2022, that, that leave us a bit less than eight years to achieve the 2030 uh, targets and goals. So, uh, and uh, I don't want to be pessimistic, but if we continue running at this pace, we are not going to achieve this one like we didn't achieve the Formula One. So we need to act urgently. And, and for that also, we need to have a proper data. We need to have uh, empirical evidence and things that we want to do because uh, everybody tells you, oh, there is 
billions of dollars floating around on forest, something like that. And then you say, okay, and what do you want to do with this billion of dollars? And based on what and how do you going to do that? So I will stop here. I think it's uh, very important. And I hope that in 10 years from now, we will be uh, proud and say, okay, I was there when they launched the FTA partnership. Thank you very much. Back to you, Vincent. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And as you said, this partnership is, is pretty much demand driven. So this is also why one of the reasons we've uh, asked uh, Mrs. Juliette Biao Kudenukpo, who is the director of the UN Forum on Forest Secretariat, to um, give us uh, some uh, welcome address to express the, the demands that are uh, impinging our sector. So I think Fabio, it is a video because I think uh, Juliette Biao was busy to prepare UNFF next week uh, and couldn't travel to Seoul. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to begin by thanking C4 and IUFRO for the kind invitation to join today's event. Forests provide multiple goods and services which benefit people in many ways, economically, materially, health-wise, and socially. The importance of forests for the well-being of people and the planet is undeniable. Yet, despite their vital importance, we keep losing forests. The world has lost 178 million hectares. 40, 440 million acres of forest since 1990, which is an area about the size of Libya. Currently, there are many forests related international commitment and initiatives which aim to address deforestation. These include the Bond Challenge, the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement on the UNFCCC, the UN Strategic Plan for Forests, and its global forest goals, the ongoing UN decade on ecosystem restoration, and most recently, the Glasgow Declaration on Forest and Land Use. What we need is stronger cooperation and coordination among various agencies outside and within the UN system to achieve all these goals and targets and ultimately secure sustainable forest management. UNFF brings together both policy and technical expertise and it is well placed to be custodian in this work. The UN Strategic Plan for Forests 2030, forged by the UNFF and adopted by GEA in 2017, serves as an excellent framework for the forest-based work of the United Nations system and for fostering partnerships and enhanced coherence, collaboration and synergies among various bodies and partners on forests. The implementation of sustainable forest management depends on the contribution of all relevant stakeholders, including governments and forest owners, indigenous peoples, local communities, local authorities, the private sector, including small, medium and large forest-based enterprises, non-governmental organizations, women, children and youth. It also requires the mobilization of scientific community, scientific input, and the best available scientific and traditional forest-related knowledge. Please allow me to highlight a few areas of work where the scientific input are currently needed. Forests are vital to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and Achievement of the SDGs. However, achieving all the SDGs currently poses a major challenge. Let me provide you one example. Forests and sustainable forest management are at the center of the SDG 15, whereas SDG 2 seeks to end hunger, achieve food security and nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. Currently, much of the agricultural expansion related to achieving global food security is at expense of forests. A business as usual approach to food production will continue to cause mass deforestation. This will be damaging for biodiversity, 
impacting forest dwelling communities who depend on forests for the direct provision of food. We do need more scientific research on forest trees and agroforestry models to address these issues with minimal trade-off. Another area where we still need a strong scientific involvement is establishing the true and full value of forest. As of today, the full contribution of forests to ecosystems, society and sustainable development remains drastically underestimated owing to a lack of methodologies and socio-economic data. Many benefits and services provided by forests are currently not measured or valued in quantifiable terms. Once the real value of forests is established, it will no longer be profitable to the forest owner to convert and use forest land for other uses, such as large-scale production of agricultural commodities and or pasture. Valuing forests fully is one of the main paths to stop deforestation and to ensure that forests can be utilized as a nature-based solution to combat climate change, protecting biodiversity and preventing future pandemics. In terms of solution to valuing forests, government, academia, NGOs, private sector and consumers have major role to play. The role of scientific community is particularly important to provide a solid evidence base with systematic data related to valuing all the socio-economic benefits provided by forests. Forests are at the heart of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. The decade runs from 2021 through 2030, which is also the timeline scientists have identified as the last chance to prevent catastrophic climate change. The decade is our chance to turn the tide on deforestation and forest degradation. However, experience shows that restoring forests and other degraded ecosystems is not an easy task, as ecosystems are in a constant state of flux and working on one ecosystem may have adverse impact on the other. Ecosystems also change as climate changes and new uncertainties arise. Returning to a former state of an ecosystem may not bring the best results due to new and different environment and conditions and may lead to hotter temperatures, frequent extreme weather events and or shifting rainfall. There might be also need for different species or composition of species. Scientific understanding of how to restore and adapt ecosystems is still evolving. However, this knowledge is essential to us halting deforestation and forest degradation. Lastly, as the main drivers of deforestation lie beyond forest sector, finding a solution is a complex endeavor. Scientific community can play an important role in helping policymaking officials to find cross-sectoral policies and solutions to address this challenge through sound scientific data and information. In short, there is still much to be done in research on the role of forest, trees, and agroforestry in sustainable development, food security, and addressing climate change. The various events organized during the World Forestry Congress provide excellent opportunities for discussion on forest and forest-related issues and help to position forests and forestry as an integral part of sustainable development at all levels. They are particularly beneficial to disseminate the key results of research, not only among the global forest community, but also strive to reach out to the practitioners at the national and local levels. In this respect, I would like to thank C4 and IUFRO as the important science-based organizations for convening this event. I thank you. Okay, so uh, a virtual uh, thank you to uh, Mrs. Uh, Biao um, with a recorded statement from, from New York. Uh, and now, uh, without further ado, I will give the pass the floor to Alexander Berg, the Executive Director of uh, IUFRO, and 
the idea now, and Alexander will introduce the speakers, is that we have presentations and, and perspectives from all the partners of, that are now constructing this new partnership together. Uh, some are online and, and some will intervene from, from the floor. Um, yeah, so Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vincent. And uh, thank you in general uh, to CIFR for the kind invitation to UFRO to partner with you in organizing and convening this side event. A very good evening to everyone here physically present in the room, which was indeed not very easy to find. And of course, a very, very warm welcome also to the audience joining online. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I realized that for some of you, it's really the middle of the night. So we uh, really would like to applaud you for joining the event at such uh, at, at this time. As Vincent already mentioned, we now want to hear from experts representing FDA partner organizations about what they consider to be the, uh, the new demands on forests and trees, and more specifically, what the role of research and development uh, should be in addressing uh, those needs. Um, more specifically, we want really to investigate the question, what is needed from research and development to support the roles of forests and trees in achieving the various SDGs, and some of them have already mentioned been mentioned by the UNFF Director General. Once more, my name is Alexander Buck, and I'm the UFRO um, Executive Director. Um, I will introduce the panelists as they are going to take the floor. And it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce as our first panelist, Dr. John Verrotte, who is the president of IUFRO. Uh, and John, in his day job, is also the national program leader for international science issues at the United States Forest Service Research and Development Branch. John, could I ask you to join the panel? Thank you very much, Alexander, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be participating in, in this, uh, this event, uh, this historic event um, that we'll be talking about 10 years from now that we were, we were here. Um, actually, what I have to say uh, resonates very, very much with, uh, with what um, Madame Biao has just, has just uh, said. Um, my thoughts on, on this whole issue are very aligned, very closely with her. So I, I, I think, she, I think she has a lot of uh, extremely good insight into what is what is needed. Um, so yeah, I've been asked to, to say a little bit about what I see as the, the frontiers in, in forest science uh, that can contribute to the um, well, to the goals of, of the FTA. And I'm basically going to basically two messages that I'd like to, to convey. You know, one is the need to make better use of what we already know, and this comes both from from Western science that's evolved over the last 200 years, but also from traditional knowledge, which has evolved in, in you know, countless uh, indigenous and local communities worldwide over millennia, if not longer. Um, the second, and then after that, I'd like to, uh, the second you know, area that uh, I think is, uh, I'd like to cover is, uh, actually new knowledge that needs to be generated to, to, uh, to deal with changing, with changing circumstances, in, in specifically uh, climate change and the needs, of, the needs to, uh, to, to enhance uh, rural economies, which I think is a fundamental objective of the FTA. So with respect to, the, uh, to, to making use of, of what we already know, it's actually a frontier, and then the, that, that frontier is overcoming our fear of learning from the past, and, re, and as a consequence, our tendency to, to reinvent the wheel over and over again. Um, as I just mentioned, there's a very strong foundation in the biophysical sciences related to forests that's evolved over, over the last 200 years, um, related to silviculture, genetics, uh, wood science, um, you know, all fields of, of, of forest science that, 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 that uh, need, to be, need to be used. Um, yeah, I mean, and just as an illustration of, of what I'm talking about, about making better use of what we already know. Um, and this is, this is, I think, true in most, most of the fields uh, that we're talking about in the area of, uh, with respect to say forest landscape restoration. 
um, and restoration in general. There's, a, there's an astonishing, there seems to be an astonishing ignorance of the body of knowledge that exists on the, uh, the silviculture of, of countless numbers of species of trees um, that can be found in, in some old standard reference books, but also buried in, the, in research files of, of, of organizations and universities uh, worldwide. Um, in India, for example, you know, I'm, it's an area of the world that I'm quite quite familiar with. With uh, you know, there's there's some standard references that, that deal with hundreds and a huge proportion of the total number of tree species you, uh, that are that have been used uh, over the years in India. Uh, but when you look at the when you look at the restoration programs, only a very small fraction of of, of those species are being used. And this is this is really tragic because uh, it, it's really it cuts off the the number of options that, uh, that people are using. It's not making use of all the information related to the environmental tolerances of trees, their silviculture, how, the, their propagation techniques, and all the way down to their utilization. And this is and I'm not I don't want to pick on India because the same could be said of so many other countries in the world. Um, so in so in. That's just one example of, of research in, in, in biophysical sciences. But as I said, it applies, I think, to, to many other areas in terms of ecology, forest health, um, uh, cultivation and utilization of non-timber forest products, forest hydrology. You know, we, we know a lot already and we should be using it. Uh, research in the social sciences, although it's, uh, it's much newer, uh, probably I would say decades old versus a couple of centuries. Um, here too, you know, we possess an ever-growing uh, body of knowledge on the dynamics of the critical dimensions of human interactions with forests, as well as methodologies for evaluating them. And these, these are, you know, this is forest science has, in these past decades, has been enriched by the contributions of sociology, economics, um, and, and many other fields that have decided to to join us in our efforts to uh, to better understand forests and and their interactions with with human society, and it's from it's from the social sciences that we 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 have the expertise and the development of methodologies used to to fully evaluate the values of uh, the, to, to evaluate the full values of forests, which is which is indeed a um, I think a, a very necessary objective. Now this. The role of the scientific committee in making use of all of this, this vast store of knowledge that's underutilized at present, I think it's really our responsibility as scientists uh, to dig out this information, synthesize it, and communicate it to the various uh, users uh, who, who need it at this point. People in other sectors, people uh, working in non-governmental organizations with uh, who, all basically with with all of the uh, with all the potential uses of, of information uh, now when it comes to traditional knowledge um you know we hear a lot of mention of, of it. it we we know it's it's a vast um underutilized resource but of course um it's it's something that, that, that needs to be applied um in in with, with the, what needs to be developed uh, not developed but uh used in conjunction many times with with western science and um, and primarily in the in the areas where this traditional knowledge is is uh, has been has been developed uh, in with and with those communities, um, you know, many many uh, strengths of, of traditional knowledge. It's it's usually much more detailed um, in in its understanding of, of of local environments and local local forest uh, dynamics. Um, it's based on generations of experience, uh, experimentation, and innovation. It's holistic in its outlook, uh, which uh, the boundaries between you know, between the ecosystem and social systems are, uh, you know, they, they, in many cases they just don't exist. So it's a very it's a very full uh, knowledge system, which of course is exactly what the kind of thinking uh, that we we need to be adopting. Um, so yeah, there again is this, this vast pool of traditional knowledge that's that's needed to uh, that, that needs to be um, respected and utilized as as appropriate in our efforts. 
Um, then, I, then there's a, that second broad category of research that's that's needed um, to adapt to changing circumstances and changing realities, really. And the first is, of course, climate change. And although we do possess an enormous amount of, of knowledge um, already, um, it, our knowledge is being tested as as environmental conditions change very quickly. And I think genetics is, is one field where a lot of work is, is needed in this area. You know, genetic manipulation for increased drought tolerance of, of trees, uh, for use in, in assisted migration efforts and so on. Um, forest ecology is, you know, the boundaries are being tested by, by climate change. Um, you know, we, there's, there's much to be gained through further research to better predict uh, the uh, impacts of climate change in terms of um, uh, forest species, uh, both plants and animals, um, you know, how, how, they're, how, how assemblages are changing and, and, and what the future holds for, for forests as a result of, of climate change. And, in, um, and there, again, there, there are many other examples that I, I could go into, um, but I think I don't want to take up the whole time um, that's, that, that other people need to speak. So I'll just close there and hope uh, provided a couple of a couple of key uh, key messages. Again, the need to make better use of what we already know, and secondly, to focus our, our new research efforts on on the uh, on 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 on, on, on what is needed to, to to adapt to changing economic and environmental conditions. So, with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Parata John, for this a very important reminder that actually a lot is known already in the sciences, especially in the biophysical sciences, but there's also an evolving body of knowledge in the social sciences, as you pointed out. And thank you also for reminding us of the need to use different sources of knowledge, including traditional forest knowledge. I know that this is a topic that is also very close to, to your heart, so a very important reminder. John, if I could ask you to have a seat at the podium later on for the interactive panel discussion. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, next I would like to invite Mr. Sumpi Jin uh, to actually share his perspective on the new demands on forest trees. Mr. Jin is the Vice Executive Director of the Asia Forest Corporation organization and as such representing an organization that has a vast experience in the implementation of the topics that we are discussing today. Mr. Jin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Mm. Just five minutes for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> very important event uh, for APOCO, APOCO Ministerial Meeting just finished it, so I could join this meeting. First of all, on behalf of APOCO, I would like to say thank you for inviting me. As an intergovernmental organization, APOCO also is interested in this partnership. We have been facing the climate change as a global challenge, which forest sector is one of the essential part to achieve the climate goal of UNFCCC. The increasing demand on forests to address climate change was confirmed with the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use in 2021. Since 2020, the COVID-19 has become another global change we face in 2021 through a thematic dialogue on the potential of forests to recover from the COVID-19 with the six APOCO member countries, we confirmed that national demands on forests to build back better and greener uh, increasing. Another emerging demand on forest is from the private sector as ESG management became a trend for corporate opportunity for resource mobilization in forest sector are emerging. With the vision of a greener Asia with the resilient forest landscape and communities, APOCO has been implementing project activities in the member countries aligned with our strategic plan 
to 2023 in initiating customized restoration, supporting R&D in climate change adaptation, introducing systemic management of forest disasters, local livelihood improvement, and enhancing institutional capabilities. As mandated on the Article 9 of the APOCO Agreement, and in order to achieve the vision of APOCO, the Regional Forestry Corporation should provide policy decision support for, for forest policy formulation and implementation, capacity development for professional competencies and mobilizations of resources. Thus, we would like to suggest the role of research on forestry and agroforestry is to provide scientific evidences to support decision making of policy makers and investors to capture or emerging demands and opportunities to unleash full potential of forest for the sustainable development. APOCO will conti continue to promote and undertake realistic and action-oriented forest cooperation programs and to achieve its mission. However, to address the global demands, we need a global effort and research cooperation to share knowledge and learn from each other. We would like to invite research partners to develop and implement joint project for forest trees and agroforestry in Asia to promote scientific evidence-based advocacy, communication, and engagement for sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jin Kamsa Hamnida, for this uh, very important uh, contribution for highlighting both some of the new emerging challenges and trends, such as the COVID um, and also the ESG management and the role of the private sector more generally, but also thank you for reminding us of this need to provide a sound evidence base for decision making on current and emerging uh, issues. That is very much appreciated. As our next uh, panelist, I would like to invite Ms. Arlene, Dr. Arlene lopez Samson, uh, to actually share with us her perspective on the topic. Uh, Dr. lopez Samson is a principal researcher at CATIE, the Tropical Research and Higher Education Center. And uh, Dr. lopez Samson, very understandably, will join us virtually. So hello, Dr. Samson. I hope you can hear us and see us. I have a video for Dr. Arlene Samson, even though oh. she is with us. So I don't know if she wants to say two words before we launch the video, or she's happy with me launching the video. Okay. Yes, please, Fabio, just launch the video. Okay. Thank you very much, Arlene. Thank you very much. Watch out, Curtis. Yes, Hello everyone, my name is Arlene Lopez from Katia and it's an honor for me to be joining this discussion about trees and agroforestry research for a better future. Trees and agroforestry are important for livelihoods. In this example, we can see how the shade canopy of a cocoa agroforestry system can significantly contribute to the provision of vitamins, proteins, and carbs. And it also shows the contribution a family can gain from the shade canopy of a cocoa agroforestry system. And this contribution, it depends on the design of the agroforestry system. And we can see that neither too complex or too simple a cocoa agroforestry system in terms of botanical composition, plant density, and vertical and horizontal spatial complexity is needed. Agroforestry and trees are also important for the environment and crop production. In this example, we can see the contribution of cocoa agroforestry system and other arrangement 
to support biodiversity and also the capacity of some agroforestry to storage carbon. And we have uh, the contribution of trees to soil macrofauna that is important to sustain crops production. Trees and agroforestry, however, are missing from national frameworks. For example, they are not included in laws, institutions, or policies. They are not even included in national accounting or reporting systems. And also, we don't find trees or uh, agroforestry topics in the education systems or curricula. Um, and also, we don't find these topics on extension program. These issues can lead to have an uh, underdeveloped tree-based value change, and also farmers don't see trees as a crop, um, leading to suboptimal agroforestry designs in, in our countries. So we believe that with this platform, we can tackle these issues and fully realize the potential of agroforestry and trees in our countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Lopez Samson, for highlight highlighting these issues. Um, the, uh, the, the lack of uh, forest values being accounted for has also been mentioned earlier on in the statement by the director of the UN Forum on Forests. So I think that point resonates a lot. And I'm personally very thankful to you for also having raised the importance of raising the profile of agroforestry in the curricula around the globe. Uh, this also actually corresponds with the finding of a recent global forest education project that my own organization has been involved in. So a very pertinent point. Thanks a lot. As a last panelist, last but certainly not least, we do have Dr. Pablo Pacheco, who is the Global Forest Lead Scientist at WWF. Uh, Dr. Pacheco has also provided a recorded video message, and I would ask Fabio to now uh, show the message, the video. Thank you. I'm Pablo Pacheco, Global Forest Lead Scientist at WWF. Thanks for the invitation to offer some remarks about the new Forest, Trees and Agroforestry Partnership launched today. And we at WWF are in the process of coming on board. First, I would like to acknowledge the leadership of the Forest, Trees and Agroforestry program and their member organizations for embracing and carrying forward the vision to build this new partnership aimed at supporting the transformational change that our world needs. This through a perspective that highlights the options and opportunity that forests, trees, and agroforestry offer to achieve sustainable development while contributing to a stabilized climate and safeguard biodiversity and nature, as well as the contributions of nature to people. As the global challenges of climate change, biodiversity loss, and social inequality tend to aggravate, having different implications for forest users and society at large, we are increasingly in need for collective efforts, actions, and partnership to deal with these global challenges. Facing these challenges require us to focus our efforts to better link science and policy and practice, to inform and guide public, private, and civil society actions based on the best available science, but also to find pathways on what are the most cost-effective, equitable, and inclusive responses adapted to different social, economic, and cultural contexts. The different individual organizations that are embracing the new FTA partnership are certainly following this path according to their own vision, mission, and mandates, but working and engaging together in knowledge generation and evidence-based advocacy and implementation of actions on the ground may contribute to achieve collectively a greater impact. This new FTA partnership must build on existing lessons and opportunities for accelerating and scaling impact. The commitments embraced by governments, companies, and social organizations to stop deforestation, support forest and landscape restoration, and achieve net zero which have forests and trees at the center, offer the chance to build together frameworks for impact, cost-effective transition pathways, 
science-based targets and approaches and metrics for impact monitoring. Additionally, the growing recognition of indigenous peoples and local communities as stewards of nature creates an important opportunity to engage them and by building on their knowledge and local practices to support them in strengthening their contributions to the whole society. This partnership should base its actions on the fundamental principle that positive outcomes for both people and nature depend on anchoring and integrating human and nature rights into the areas of scientific inquiry and the co-development of frameworks for action that are inspired by local knowledge, practices, values, and collective wisdom. Three ingredients should be considered for this partnership to make a difference. The first, this partnership should inspire, build, and promote holistic and integrated perspectives of understanding of nature and society interactions and systems thinking, which at the same time should build on a specialized disciplinary knowledge for recommending options and responses involving use of forest trees and agroforestry for positive impacts on people, nature, and climate. The second ingredient for this partnership to succeed is to become truly collaborative and effectively bridge perspectives and interests of both research and implementation organizations by offering a shared research and action agenda focused on forestries and agroforestry. The third ingredient is to be able to embrace and actively support an inclusive science across all their dimensions. This involves cross-learning among scientists from different backgrounds to involve scientists from less developed countries as well as scientists from minority groups. An inclusive science also involves actively working on the co-creation of knowledge, which offers the opportunity to tap into the collective wisdom. In short, this partnership should not only be about to put together the organization's actions on the generation of knowledge and evidence-based advocacy and implementation, but to do so in ways that are able to generate an impact at the speed and the scale that is urgently needed. Thanks for your attention. We thank uh, Dr. Pacheco for having highlighted these uh, three ingredients and therefore having given us what I consider to be a good recipe for the future work of the FTA partnership. Um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, both uh, all, all those of you present here in the room, as well as those joining us online, it is now your turn uh, for an interactive, for the interactive segment of this side event. Um, questions. Um, and the, the first slide of question actually looks at what uh, the new demands are towards forests and trees in tropical landscapes and globally. You are asked to actually provide the one keyword that you consider to be the most significant new demand towards forests and trees in tropical landscapes and globally. Uh, since not all of you may be familiar with the Slido, I would ask Fabio to very briefly explain how that works. Thank you very much, Alexander. So as you will see uh, my screen on display right now, there is a website that you have to join or you can scan the QR code with your mobile phone and uh, click on the link that will become active. Uh, once you reach the website, you can uh, type this code, which is WFC, stands for World Forestry Congress, FDA, which is the partnership we are launching today, and you will join the room the Slido room. And now I will activate the Slido so you will see the first question that um, Alexander has just mentioned. And the code is always available on your on the left side. So you can always join if you haven't yet. And uh, you can uh, type your question. Uh, oh, sorry, your answer. Yeah, so, well, no, that's the code of the, of the room. But okay, we'll we'll take it as take that as a test. So we'll give it a bit of time for people to join. 
Yeah, perfect. So the answers are coming in. I admire you. My technical talent is very limited, but it seems that each one of you is much more skillful than I am. So we do already have a good number of terms, key terms, key demands uh, for the role of uh, forests and trees in the future in tropical landscapes and globally. And I once more would also want to encourage our um, uh, participants online to, uh, to scan the QR code or visit the web page and give us the terms. And here we are. So we do already have some front runners, the nutrition, the well-being, but there are many more terms that are displayed on the, on the screen, as you can see, and more keep coming in. Livelihoods also turn out to be a very important term. So it seems we do have some nice terms, Fabio, should we still keep it open a little while or? Yes, I think the answers are still coming in. So uh, you can see there's a little number on top. So it gives you the number of answers that have been uh, pitched in and it's growing still. So you want to might maybe give it another second. It's changing very quickly. Now wood is become, has become the lead. Wood takes the center stage at yes. the moment. But other terms that are very popular are well being, biodiversity, uh, livelihoods, valuation, and uh, obviously also climate adaptation. Yeah. This is quite exciting, I must say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So I, I think we're, we, we're, we're stuck at 33. So this is the overall result. So we got just so, one, one new now, but I think we can move. Thank you, Fabio. Then let's close this slide of Paul for the time being. Uh, don't be disappointed. There will be a second round where you can again, you know, uh, give an answer through the slide of Paul. So looking at uh, the screen, we, we do now have uh, three terms that feature very prominently, the top three, I would say, climate adaptation. And indeed, that has also been mentioned by several of the uh, the panelists uh, has been identified as a really as an as a, a major new demand, um, not precisely new, but certainly very important. Wood, I, I guess, also against the background drop of, you know, uh, the political events globally, wood has become, if anything, even more important. Valuation has been mentioned by several of the panelists, but also the audience considers it to, to be a very important uh, demand for the future. And that is followed by the terms nutrition, biodiversity, well-being, ecosystem services, livelihoods and resilience. So I think we can see a, a good spectrum of new demands on forests and trees. And um, I ask you now to keep these terms in mind as we are going to proceed with the next slide of question, because the next slide of question uh, is the following. What are the major constraints or bottlenecks uh, to unlocking the potential of forests and trees to meet these new demands? So what are the major constraints and bottlenecks, for example, really for adapting forests effectively, forests and trees in, in agroforestry landscapes uh, to uh, cl climate change? How can we ensure wood production in the future um, and so forth? And I now again encourage you to uh, submit your key terms. And already they keep coming in. Governance and land right feature very uh, strongly at the moment. We do also have a solution already, which is the FTA partnership in the future <laughs> that was briefly visible on the screen. Finance, uh, conflicting interests, um, and more keep coming. Poor governance and knowledge have joined the, the most prominent, uh, the most frequently mentioned terms. So governance really continues to take a center stage in this slide, it seems, with related issues such as the land rights, uh, the, uh, the sectoral approach, the conflicting interests, and so on. And Fabio, I think we do have 39 answers already. So our participants are very active, which is very good. Yep. 
and it seems to have stopped at 39 so I'll, I'll block the voting and you can comment oh no we have a 40th one okay perfect right, that's uh, a, a round number that, that yeah, looks okay, good okay we can lock, we can lock it let's okay, it's close locked. it's close the slido poll here and i think what is quite clear from the results of this slido that really issues of governance are a major constraint or bottleneck that limits you know the currently the contribution of forests and trees in landscapes towards you know meeting the new demands that we have been you know um that we have seen in the previous slido and there are a number of issues that are related to this broader issue of governance such as the the land rights um the the conflicting interests of the different uh, stakeholders uh, the inconsistent policies but also partly some solutions such as incentives as policy instruments um and so on um but also you know uh, knowledge and education and features quite prominently in, in this slido. So um, I would like to thank everyone, both uh, you colleagues in the room, but also the participants online for having been so active um, in this slido. And now actually, I would like to ask our panelists, both the two uh, physically present in the room, but also the one uh, uh, online, um, uh, to, uh, to actually now reflect uh, very briefly on the following question. Now that you have seen and heard, you know, what the demands are and what the bottlenecks are, what in your view are the most important research and knowledge gaps in terms of addressing these new demands, but also the constraints? And I guess the, that question goes first and foremost to our panelists representing the scientific community. So John and um, also um, our colleague from Akatie, what do you consider to be the most important research and knowledge gaps? Shall I begin? Please, John, please. Yeah, no, I think the, the one that, that, that's, that stood out in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that slide, um, I, think, I think the issue of valuation, I think that that's probably, I think that that's uh, getting, a, getting a better handle on, on the full value of forests for, for people in, in, in all dimensions of, of forest values, whether, whether it's not just economic, but social, cultural, uh, spiritual, I mean, the evaluation methods for these things are, are you know, very much uh, under development and, and need, to be, need to be further explored under particular and adapted to particular um, landscapes. Um, I think this is a, this is a, a, a key, uh, is of key importance, particularly for influencing policy, because I think at present, forests are uh, really, really aren't seen as, as a value for anything other than, than wood and plus the $2 per ton of carbon. Uh, so clearly we're, we're not, we're not, we're not make, making the, the, the case for the full value of forests at present. And I would pick on that one as, as a priority. Thank you very much, John. I guess this is perhaps not only a research challenge, but also a challenge of communication and also of political decision-making, but a very important one. Arlene, could I ask you what in your view is the most important research or what are the most important research and knowledge gaps with regards to the demands and bottlenecks that have been identified by our participants? Yeah, I think uh, one of the main things that we need to do more research or how to communicate better with the with uh, decision makers is about the tree rights because uh, people don't realize the, the, the full potential from trees because they don't have the, the, the rights to cut the, to harvest the trees. So I think we need to better understand on and to provide the knowledge about these uh, these um, rights, how how to to acknowledge the right from, from the people, from the communities to access uh, forests or trees that, that, that grow in their farm. So we need to, to tackle that. And also we, we have seen that um, research don't, don't go to, to the university and change the, the, the curricula. So we need to do more, more uh, involvement with the university programs. So we need to acknowledge how to manage trees and better have skills and knowledge to um, to understand how to grow trees and how to introduce trees and other management options so so we so we have the full landscape of solution not only plots or with trees but also inserting these trees with other components like um yeah like 
uh, agroforestry system, cocoa or coffee, or growing annual crops. So we need to introduce continuum of trees management at the landscape level. So I think we need to, to, to have better understanding on how to communicate this with at this level, with the university level, with the extension, and also don't forget the things about rights. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Arlene, for making these uh, very important points. And I saw Vincent taking many notes, so <laughs> the, the, your input by all the panelists has been very properly recorded. Of course, I mean, the research uh, is one part of the solution, but of course, the future partnership will be much more than that. It will also be about, you know, communication, uh, dissemination, but also about implementation, stakeholder engagement. And therefore, I want to follow up with one other question both to the audience in the room, but also the panel. Uh, and that is uh, what are the most important um, implementation and policy gaps in addressing these needs, as this will be equally important. And um, I'm looking at the audience here in the room. I'm not sure, Mr. Dean, if you would like to speak briefly to the topic of uh, what are the most implementation and policy gaps. Uh, oh, based on my experience, uh, I was a uh, project manager in Indonesia uh, 10 years ago. I, I, I was uh, um, uh, worked in Korean Forest Service, I'm government officials at the time. Uh, I had two, two projects, one is uh, ARCDM in very dry land, the Lombok and the East Lombok, and, and another project was uh, RDD plus the capacity building and, and energy. Well, actually, I, I, I was a, a second project manager. First, my uh, former project manager already planned to plant Three species already decided, but it's impossible because of so it is different. But uh, the, the planting season is only three months December, January, February. <laughs> only, only three months we can truly plant tree. So, and another. Uh, Challenge is the the site uh, which which planted the trees uh, uh, planted another species corn corn, corn species we first planted planted tree our, our project for our project at the after that the site all of the site is to corn growing, so uh, we changed our our plan. Uh, is changed to plant uh, fruit trees, fifty percent fruit trees. After that, it was improved. So I, <laughs> uh, in my experience, we uh, we need. The, the considering the field, field situation. So it, that's, that's my first experience. And second is my maybe four years, five years ago, I already worked in Mongolia. Mongolia, there is very, uh, we, we, our, our project is the green belt project the for, uh, for for anti desertification so we we need some fence uh, fencing and we need some the uh, watering so and the Site is very uh, expensive <laughs> because the every every five days uh, we need watering. 
So I need uh, researchers in uh, Naipos in Korea, uh, Korea forest science uh, researcher. I the I request the researcher to uh, research the different watering system. So it was one uh, we around uh, about the five zone. The one zone is was same same watering system, and another is no watering. So number three is the uh, monthly based. Anyway, we 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 could. Uh, or uh, some researches, so uh, maybe it's evidence based to we watering system. I I try to the, for I don't know the, the uh, before the result I come back to Korea. So I, yeah. Anyway, this is my experience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chin, for sharing with us these uh, practical examples that also illustrate you know the challenge of applying the scientific evidence on the ground. And I think we all sense the passion with which you went about uh, these, uh, these undertakings. So thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, yes, I think we do have uh, time for one uh, intervention from the, from the floor. And then since we're already lagging behind schedule slightly, um, I think we, we must move on to the next part, but please. Uh... Thanks, thanks very much, Alexander. I just wanted to, to raise, uh question mark about Andrew could I ask you to use the Sorry, microphone I just wanted to raise a question in response to a point that John raised in his introductory remarks which is how are we responding to changing circumstances which aren't just climate change I think we're all cognizant that we are now in a particularly those of us who live in Europe in a new context in terms of a conflict on our borders which is having profound implications in terms of global wheat and sunflower markets and what I noticed in the two slides, in terms of the Slido responses, the whole issue of agri-food commodity markets did not feature at all. And yet the evidence that we have that's been published in umpteen journals suggests that probably the major driver of deforestation is associated with... Okay, <laughs> Vincent has now put it in. Good. <laughs> so... so I just wanted to raise that issue because I think it is uh, an extremely important issue. And that, that's partly inspired by an excellent panel that I attended previously uh, to this session uh, that was hosted by IDH from Indonesia. So I just wanted to raise that. Thank you, Andrew. Dr. Andrew Bordel, C for, for also you know, bringing our attention, the need to actually also think broadly beyond our own sectoral boundaries. Of course, this is a Congress here focused predominantly on forest per se, but I think that this is really very important to keep this in mind. Thank you very much. But I do believe that in the, in the, in the next segment of this side event, we do also have a, a few uh, answers or potential you know, um, modalities for finding answers to the new demands and challenges that have been raised. And therefore, it's my pleasure to hand uh, the, uh, the floor back to, uh, to, to hand the podium back to Vincent to moderate the, the next segment of the side event. And thank you to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. And so in the last uh, half an hour, we will uh, present the new partnership. So what we wanted to do is have a joint presentation of all the partners, the certain partners that are currently um, engaging, constituting this, this partnership. Uh, it was a bit difficult to have uh, one presentation with 13 voices. So I will make one initial presentation, but then um, the partner, some of the partners in the room and, and some online will, will say a little bit about their perspectives, uh, why are they most interested in, uh, and in fact, why are they, uh, why do they want to team up uh, to do all of this? Uh, so the, the, the presentation, so I, I just apologize that not anyone involved in the constitution of the party will be able to speak today, but there'll be for sure other opportunities because we, we don't have sufficient time. Okay, so, um, so the, the, the premises for, 
for a new FTA started, uh, as Robert has, has also mentioned, um, a bit more than a, well, a year ago uh, in, in 2011, when there was first a, a, an external review of, of, uh, of the CGIR collaborative research program that concluded that the program was successful and that it needed to somehow evolve and continue to address some, some critical research for development needs. Uh, and there is the global impetus that we all know about, about the big issues and the big conferences that have launched, uh, in fact, new, new agendas ahead that have, in fact, reinforced the importance of forest and trees and agroforestry to achieve all of the multiple objectives. And most importantly, that this really requires some new forms of collaborative approaches. So we've, we've, we've also laid the ground on, on a very solid um, uh, scientific and, and implementation collaboration for a decade. So we just published with all the partners, a series of uh, 18 the historical partners, in fact, uh, of phase one and two, a series of highlights that uh, explains and details all the achievements uh, over a decade and build on that. Uh, our idea or common idea was to build something that would help actors, other actors, to work with other actors, to strengthen and to leverage fully the contribution of forestries, agroforestries for the SDGs. So that's both the synergies and the trade-offs and, and, and the solutions to develop for actors. And to do that, there are three main functions uh, of the partnership. First, knowledge and solution generation, compilation, analysis, and sharing. Uh, and and that, these are functions that are already functions of the partners and uh, some of the partners share all the three functions so that the idea is really to, 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 to pull things up and to, and to share and to learn across. Uh, this first function will go from scientific knowledge, technical options, methods, methods tools, approaches, um, to, to management and also policy options uh, across a range of contexts as we've seen is often a bottleneck if we do it, if we do it wrong or maladapted. Um, and facilitation of exchange of knowledge and lessons learned. The second one is evidence-based advocacy, communication, engagement. I think that's a, a, a touchy issue that we, we don't think we should shy away from making the case in an evidence-based way that forestry and agroforestry matter uh, and make that visible also in other sectors. Here we're talking to the forestry world, but we, we need to do that also in other sectors. Uh, and, and, and then the third is operational engagement. So that is not necessarily to... Uh, to do uh, completely uh, new modalities than was existing before, but it's just that the, this new partnership will facilitate and support the sourcing of funds and co-development of projects um, across um, amongst partners uh, towards on the ground actions. Um, and um, this is a partnership of complementary partners to, to have collaborative gains and synergies of, of meaningful size with 13, 14 perhaps, uh, for global relevance and impact, but still manageable for, for efficiency and, and building on some solid previous collaboration and mutual trust to be effective. So that also uh, funders or, or actors that would call on us, who trust us that we are able to, we know each other and we are able to deliver together in an effective and an efficient way. Uh, here in this slide in green, you have the names of the partners that are currently uh, finalizing the discussion on the charter. In fact, the charter is ready. We would have signed it here, but it's just too difficult to do it because it's a hybrid conference. So we'll do that in the next, in the next uh, few, uh, few, few days. And yeah, uh, some of the thematic priorities being discussed. Uh, I think new have probably emerged also today, but um, uh, came uh, on top of the agenda. The issues of biocircular economy, of how we link uh, the evolution of value chains and how they interplay. And, and, and act on landscapes, the issue of land use and forests, how to help the Glasgow Declaration being implemented, of course, restoration, sustainable finance, and in particular, landscape finance, which is in fact one element of the corner between of the triangle uh, with restoration and the biocircular economy, and then climate change. And last but not least, forest management for production, biodiversity, and conservation. I think these are perhaps long-standing issues that needs to be heavily revisited given the, the new demands, and then inclusion agenda. But that came from what different partners have so far discussed, but have, in fact, immediately in the next few weeks, um, some meetings to, to set that up and say, where, and decide where we could start. Um, I'm not going to enter too much into the details because we don't want to be too complicated administratively, but 
There will be a, a strategic group formed by the core partners, and the strategic group will create, call on what, whatever we call them, task force, working groups, collaborative networks, to work between, amongst themselves uh, that are voluntary, and maybe with other, most often the case with others, uh, partners to to work on an issue. Okay, uh, that, so the, the little the little dots on the bottom are projects that will be elaborated jointly with sets of partners, and then we have also the idea to all together uh, construct a vehicle for for funders, a, a trust fund that would be uh, in fact then the, um, serve the purpose of of, of especially cross-cutting and integrative activities, but also thematic activities. All of this will be, in fact, uh, settled down by the core partners in the few in the few days. We have a logo <laughs> that is also uh, um, symbolizing uh, the tree uh, as, of course, uh, the our element of work and and also and our solution for the planet. Uh, we have um, the uh, pathway here, and we have the circle, mm -hmm. the pathway towards sustainable development, and we have the circle. Uh, as the earth uh, we don't have we don't have people <laughs> and i think this is quite important we'll find a way to add people or to 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 find a way that because a logo needs to have trees but it needs to have people i think there's a clear message from today but also from this congress so now without further ado that's my short presentation on behalf of the 13 partners i i hope it's quite accurate to what we're constructing and i would like to now give the floor to some of um the um, our partners, in fact, uh, or to thank you, thank you, Alexander, to um, uh, say a few words uh, briefly. So um, perhaps calling on the podium, maybe uh, uh, Pablo Jacome. I'm not sure uh, because I have not I have not my glasses, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and then uh, Salvatore uh, Pinizotto. So uh, Pablo Jacome is from Inba represents INBA, Salvatore Pinizotto is the executive secretary of the International Rubber Study Group, uh, IRSG. And then we will have uh, on video, or, or well, live, but uh, um, uh, on video, Eric Scheitza, who is the representative of the Chef Gerao of Embrapa Florestas, and uh, Madeleine Fogde from uh, Siani, the, the Swedish International uh, Agricultural uh, Network Initiative. So, Perhaps we start uh, with, yes? One thing, uh, Eric is on Zoom and he would like to make his intervention live. So Exactly, that's that's excellent. Good. So perhaps we, we start with Pablo and my question to you is, uh, why is INBAR interested? What would you like to do with the other partners? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and also on behalf of INBAR and uh, well, my colleague, uh, Lee Yansha, who is the, the one who is leading all this program uh, from HQ. Um, well, we have a, a really good experience with, uh, with all FTA from these uh, last uh, five to six years that we have been working together and also to providing uh, and addressing some fundamental knowledge gaps that we have relating to bamboo and rattan sector. And, uh, and, and this helped to provide a solid scientific base evidence for the, for the, um, for the sector because um, we, we link it all this uh, research with an active project that we have in the field. So this is real uh, research to action because this helped to provide this evidence that, for example, in, in in region like Latin America or Africa, uh, we didn't have too much um, research regarding with bamboo. So all these experience uh, provide a really global recognition of the bamboo and rattan has a nature based solution uh, and also contribute to the better policy instrument and transformation for a linear development to a circular um, and sustainable development. Uh, up to now, we have been publishing more than uh, 70 uh, research reports and paper regarding with bamboo. It's a really uh, great contribution uh, that we have in, in this program. 
and also all these results we have been uh, showing in different uh, sessions or meeting uh, in the world, for example, in the in three Rio Convention, UNFFA, GLF event, and also through our uh, partners, uh, 48 partners. Um, however, there is a lot of things to, we need to scaling up the potential of, of this, um, uh, the bamboo that needs to be keep uh, researching. And in this new FTA partnership is an inclusive gathering of stakeholders to, from forestry and agroforestry sector built on the strength and advantage uh, of each partner. To fully manifest the trigger, the sectoral contribution to nature and human and sustainable development. Um, this new FTA partnership, uh, IMBAR will aim to partner to share our evidence in base knowledge, consolidate technical solution for outscaling and upscaling, strengthening cooperation and communication between our partners and especially with the communities and with the government. Um, the thematic priorities include for this uh, new uh, moment is biodiversity conservation on bamboo and rattan resources. I think it's really important to keep researching and linking all these experience uh, or, link, or trying to link uh, and to provide more evidence about all the, um, how the biodiversity conservation on bamboo resources can provide benefits to uh, the communities and also ecosystem restoration. I think is one of the challenges that we have uh, not only in, in, in regions like Latin America, but also in the case of um, Africa. Um, now we are talking a lot about inclusive biocircular economy. And we, thought, we think that bamboo is really a resource that can provide all these opportunities to talk with a real biocircular economy. Um, also uh, combating climate change with bamboo and facilitate better policy instrument to local, national and regional and international level coordination. So uh, as I said, uh, we are very um, uh, proud and also we are very happy to keep working together with FTA and with all the partnership that we are and we, we look forward to keep building a really strained um, research to action uh, activities regarding with bamboo. So, and also, well, it's a pleasure to finally we can meet no, in exactly. person. No, and, no? And, 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 and Pablo, I forgot to mention apologies that, that you are the, the director of the of INBA Latin America and the Caribbean office based yes. in, in Peru. No, it's, no sorry. It's in Quito, Ecuador. In Quito, Ecuador. Yes. Uh, so, um, very happy to meet you uh, in person today. Uh, the next, I think, uh, next person to give a perspective, we take a video, Fabio, from, oh no, an intervention from Eric Scheitza from Brazil, because Eric has made the kind effort to be with us at this time. Yes, Eric, Eric? is in Zoom with us. So Eric, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, greetings to all. I am Eric Scheitzer and I work to the Brazilian NARO, the National Agricultural Research Organization named Embrapa. As uh, Dr. Nazi uh, said, we would be proud in 10 years uh, about being here in this uh, lounge. But the fact is I'm already proud. I think uh, FTA, uh, coordination united a large array of people and put together organizations in the discussion. And I feel very included in this discussion since the beginning. It's not every day that we have a UFRO, FAO, NAROS and, and scientific groups of uh, all over the world. So, I'm here participating in this group to learn lessons. And the first one I learned is how to organize a cooperative project and how to bring about bring together people. So thank you very much, uh, Vincent and team. You were great along these years. 
When we look at our national priorities and vision, we see that FTA has, uh, there's a large uh, shadow of FTA vision and uh, share uh, and uh, plannings with our national, uh, our national, uh, our national priorities. So what I mean is that we think very much alike you. Uh, we hope that FTA is a voice that should uh, halt deforestation by providing paths to wealth and for people and uh, sustainable uh, environmental management. Those paths pass through certainly to sustainable management of forests, a new bioeconomy of forests, the understanding of social processes and uh, enabling forests in the life of all farmers, no matter which is the productive system that uh, supports their families. Finally, we hope that FTA provides us a, a very strong platform for communication and participation. And we've seen that uh, it is already working even before it is launched. And so with that, I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much for uh, helping us build a better future. Bye-bye, Fabio. That's it. Uh, oh, I hope I have kept my time. Oops. Thank you, Eric, for, for making the challenge to intervene so early in your, in your morning um, from Brazil. And um, then uh, we still have two speakers, uh, and, then, and then we'll perhaps have a time for an exchange that will close, but Salvatore, uh, Pinizotto, you are the executive secretary of the International Rubber Study Group. Thank you, Vincent, and uh, thanks for inviting me, uh, participating in this historic event. It doesn't happen every day to be in a historic event, and so I think I'm very glad uh, to be here and bring a bit of perspective from the rubber sector. Uh, I think it's, uh, no, we embarked with um, FTA, but uh, also with the international research uh, and rubber research and development uh, uh, board and with CIRAD as well in, uh, in a comprehensive work uh, related to climate change and the impact on uh, natural rubber system. And we started to work together in 2020, uh, June 2020. And we uh, brought forward uh, a process that um, has bring us in uh, putting together a policy paper, uh, a draft policy papers that uh, RSG also shared with uh, uh, all stakeholders in, uh, in our industry. Uh, and I think uh, this uh, exercise has showed as uh, powerful it is uh, to work together in a, a free environment and uh, sharing the information uh, with other organizations uh, and uh, research and development organizations, because I think uh, uh, research and development organizations have a big role uh, to play. Uh, also in rubber, because uh, uh, first of all, uh, as I think Robert uh, Nazi also mentioned, there is a lack of data, so we need uh, scientific-based uh, uh, information. And uh, we need also to be sure that uh, whatever we find out and the solutions that uh, we identify are also uh, brought on the ground. Because uh, today in rubber, there is a big gap in between the knowledge that uh, you know, it is created in uh, universities or research and development organizations and actually what is happening uh, on the ground. So so we need to reduce uh, this gap and to do to do so we need new partnerships so partnerships that are uh, as i said uh, based on uh, free sharing of information and uh, uh, knowledge based that uh, are across uh, 
countries and uh, beyond any borders, because uh, uh, we know that uh, there are a lot of challenges. Most of challenges are different on country by country basis, but we have the skills and the capabilities and sometimes also the knowledge to, over to overcome these challenges and make sure that uh, they become uh, opportunities for everyone. And, um, and one last point, uh, it's important uh, uh, also to develop uh, social and economic research. Because on that side, there is a completely lack of information. Uh, we know, for instance, that in natural rubber, 85% of the 40 million tons of natural rubber produced in the world every year is produced by smallholders. But we don't know exactly <laughs> who these smallholders are uh, on country by country basis and globally, and how we can really uh, help them uh, to be sustain sustainable in the long run. So we need, we have a lot, a lot to, to learn, a lot to do, uh, and uh, the only way is to do it uh, together. So I think FTA partnership uh, we, should be an opportunity for uh, everyone working in the rubber sector to take advantage of uh, this collaboration and uh, really bringing some solution on, on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Salvatore. And, and so uh, we're very glad to be up for this opportunity to really engage a new chapter of working with, with IRSG. I think Inbar joined uh, uh, the FTA uh, in uh, 2017 uh, as, a, as a co partner, and we're really delighted that based on, on already a good, good collaborative, uh, productive uh, research and development work, we can really now also continue working with IRSG. Uh, and I, when I say we, it's really not just uh, C4A craft on my own organization, it's CHAD, et cetera, and other partners working together. Last uh, speaker is Madeleine, I think from, uh, the, from a video, Fabio. Yes, correct. I am putting from it From Sweden up. and Siani. Hello to you in Seoul. My name is Madeleine Fugde and I work for Siani, the Swedish International Agriculture Network Initiative. I'm based in Sweden and I work together with another network called Fukali, the Forest Climate and Livelihood Network. We are both, both the networks are supported by SIDA. Uh, our mission is to work towards transformation of food system, making food system sustainable rights-based and inclusive of smallholder producers and marginalized groups in the landscapes. We acknowledged that we cannot talk about sustainable food systems unless we take in consideration the biosystems and the biodiversity and the healthy ecosystem, which are fundamental for the food systems. We share the vision of the partners here in the consortium we, of the importance of forest and agroforestry and landscape restoration for achievement of the sustainable development goals. In particular, we believe that food systems that are based on agroforestry systems with integration of trees in the same lands as crop production and husbandry promotes a lot a variety of ecosystem services, as well as it also enhanced biodiversity. The promotion of agroforestry system can help us to mitigate major challenges like the climate change, environmental degradation, biodiversity loss. But most importantly, it helps people to achieve a more sustainable livelihood to actually be food secure and also to produce a little bit of money that they can use for other <clears throat> purposes. We look forward to working collaboration to identify jointly with you knowledge gaps that can help us to restore the forest landscapes and agroforestry systems. We acknowledge that we need more knowledge knowledge system that's the scientific 
We will need knowledge, indigenous knowledge, we need local knowledge, we need knowledge from actors from different sectors that operate in these landscapes. It's only in collaboration and sharing knowledge with each other that we will be able to find a sustainable pathway towards the transformation of the food system that we have today. Thank you very much and good luck with your work today and the closing of this seminar. Bye bye from Sweden. Thank you, thank you, Mal Madeleine, uh, uh, for speaking also on behalf of, of Focali. Uh, so we are now running uh, over time for two minutes. So I, I guess we we can close unless there is a burning question or a burning remark from from the room. So I forgot something. Wrong. So just before we close, I would like just to uh, present some apologies to those of the partners who didn't have the chance to speak because just we couldn't have the time so we we can promise them that next time they will be the first in a row <laughs> that's tropen both international asic roderick was on was online um the alliance uh, uh Sihad and the chinese academy on forestry but next time they'll come first for sure um at the moment of closing just a few a few a few remarks i think we we're now going to hit a little bit the ground running and and, and start uh, working immediately on, on, on ideas for, for projects on, on important issues uh, when we think we are uh, most better equipped or more convincing when we go together and not necessarily the 14 together all the time, but sometimes by, by smaller groups, but at least that we share uh, what we what we gain across everybody. I was very impressed of the speed. I mean, Robert said it was very difficult or painful in the end. I was very impressed by the speed by which we we, con we are constructing this 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 partnership. Uh, I think that's really also because of the good spirit and of collaboration. I think um, you've seen that here today. Uh, and um, yes, uh, uh, what the world calls for broader partnerships uh, because we are there is a trend that we get better at what we do and then we get a bit specialized and we but but that the, the counterpart is that we need also to uh to um to team up with others that have other other spe uh, specialties or other comparative advantages and also because there are more complex solutions to be elaborated in various in a diversity of contexts and and so on and when we talk about scaling up nobody's going to scale up alone uh, that's that's for sure and uh this is where we need some form of of new form of distributed, networked partnership to put research in implementation when implementation is going to happen all over the place, but something will need to make sense and, and, and assemble uh, knowledge and information that, and, and learning as we go, learning loops as we go, that, that comes from this implementation if, we, if our governments come to implement the vision that they've set up. So uh, we need these partnerships to understand better the problems, to uh, be mobilized approaches that are more suited to context, to be more creative, and then to have, I think, to put in, this is also why we have uh, really um, put the, the effort on having um, actors in this partnership that are very close to people, uh, civil societies, and so on, because we need the perspectives of people in research to vigiate or scan collectively what's happening and what is what is the problems that are the, what are the solutions. So, as Robert uh, said at the beginning, it's time for action, but it's also time for uh, research embedded into action. So I think that's our next steps. We're going to look at the priorities and start working immediately on, on issues. Thankfully, we have no virtual means to do so. We don't need to set up a meeting in six months uh, somewhere in the world. We can do it right away. I think uh, everybody is in that spirit. So thanks, thanks to all. and. Uh, and a good suite of the suite of the Congress. Sure.